I'm Doug Harmon, I'm former city manager here in Fort Worth and head of the Convention Bureau, and I've always had a great passionate love of uh, history. And this uh, visit by President Kennedy was one of the most historical events uh, that ever taken place in, in Fort Worth. Uh, we are very honored to have a, a very, very special guest, and I'm going to have him, uh, Mike Howard, uh, introduce himself and his lovely wife. Uh, but Scott Barker is going to help me interview this this uh, uh, wonderful couple. And uh, Scott, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, please give your correct name? Scott Barker is my name and I'm a local historian. I've been studying Fort Worth history for many years and like everyone else, I'm very, very interested in the, uh, in the Kennedy visit in uh, 1963. And our, our guest, uh, Mike Howard and his wife Martha are very knowledgeable of that visit, uh, as you will shortly hear. Mike, do you want yes. to introduce yourself because you have a very distinguished uh, local history. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm Mike Howard. I was with the United States Secret Service at the time that uh, President Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy, Vice President Johnson and, and, uh, and Mrs. Johnson, and uh, John Conley, who was the governor at the time. And uh, so anyway, I was on duty at the time that they came to Fort Worth. Uh, this lady on my right is my wonderful wife of 61 years. I'd be 62 in September. She doesn't look it at all, but anyhow, this is Martha, and uh, we've been together through all of these things. Uh, everything that uh, I've been through, she's been through it twice. It's kind of like the uh, lady that danced with Fred Astaire. She had to do everything backwards, so she's been with me all that time. And in high heels. And in, in high, high heels. And in high heels. <laughs> So do you want to enter, I mean, you want to add to his introduction? I mean, I think that was, that was, super. That was pretty good. <laughs> well, Thank I you. think uh, one, of the, one of the things I think that perhaps the, we should begin with is just, you know, framing uh, the background mm -hmm. uh, from the, the standpoint of, you know, how did, uh, well, first, how did you get to Texas and how did you, what was your familiarity with Fort Worth? Well, I, of course, I've been a Texan all my life. I was born and raised uh, in Texas. Uh, I was born in Nocona, Texas, but I got the Secret Service right after graduating from uh, North Texas University over at Denton, and I was inducted into the Secret Service. And then uh, uh, I, uh, so because of being familiar with the Fort Worth area and all of North Texas, well, then we worked this area, or I did, I worked this area for the Secret Service out of Dallas. At that time, Dallas only had four Secret Service agents assigned to that, that office. It's hard to imagine today where, they, where they've got 136 regulars and uh, several other that are, are not regular, uh, including the uh, Bush detail. It's there, the presidential Bush detail. But uh, I've been in this area the better part of my life in, in North Texas. You mentioned, you didn't mention that you were the police chief here locally. Yes, I was police chief out at Saginaw, Texas, which is about three miles outside the city limits of, of uh, Fort Worth. Uh, I was uh, a police officer there and then became police chief while I was in college over in North Texas. Actually, I was in, in, in college at uh, Decatur Baptist College over at Decatur at that time. Uh, when I first came back uh, after the Korean War, well, I uh, had to go back to work, so I got a job with the police department working the night shift and so and uh, while I was going to school in the daytime. But anyway, that's how I, uh, they, I was assigned to Fort Worth on the day that uh, President Kennedy was coming to Fort Worth with uh, the his entourage. So uh, when did you first join the uh, Secret Service? 1961, I was uh, inducted into the Secret Service. And uh, did your background with horses and and all of that prove to be a, a, an important asset in the Secret well, Service? Well, uh, I suppose so. Uh, the, the Secret Service was so different from some of the other uh, agencies like the FBI. The FBI at the time wanted lawyers or uh, CPAs. That's what they wanted in, in the, in the uh, FBI. The Secret Service it was more versatile. They needed people in just about every 
walks of life because of the fact that if you're protecting someone or even if you're working counterfeiting, you need to be able to work with all kinds of people. If you're protecting the President of the United States, then uh, it'd be nice if you knew something about the things that they do in your own background. In other words, yes, I did. I was, I was raised around horses all my life, and so I knew a little bit about them, and so it, that came in handy uh, because of uh, the different people that, that, ride, uh, that rode horseback. So in the same way with shooting, I was, uh, I was always a, an avid uh, shooter with pistols. And so that comes in handy in, in the Secret Service too because of protecting the people you did. So uh, I don't know of, of anything else that I did that was going to come in handy at the time, but there were a lot of things that did come in handy. I mean, after you get to talking to people. I, I had a way with, uh, and, and I don't mean this in the, in the, in the wrong way, I had a way with women, and so therefore I could talk with women. And so uh, a lot of the interviews that I had to make while interviewing someone that was a suspect for uh, stealing government checks, uh, forging government checks, or, or uh, working in a counterfeiting, or someone that had to do with the assassination or plans of an assassination. If you can talk to a, a woman, then a lot of times, you, if, you, if you're nice enough, then you can get some information that you want from them. So I had, I had a kind of a gift of gab, if you will, with, with women. God gave me that. It wasn't my fault. I, I've told my wife it's not my fault. Ah, there we go. May I ask a question? Yes, ask what, yes. Mike, at one point during the Kennedy administration, you were assigned to protection of Jacqueline Kennedy and her, and her children. Is that correct? Uh, on a temporary basis, only on a t temporary basis. I. Uh, I didn't, uh, uh, I wasn't assigned to the Kennedy de detail as a member of the Kennedy detail, mm -hmm. but you worked uh, temporary uh, uh, times. And, and while uh, Mr. Uh, Kennedy was in, in the White House, mm -hmm. I was assigned there twice on like a 30-day detail at one time. Uh, working with uh, Mrs. Kennedy, she stayed out at Hyannis Port, which is their home in the summertime most of the time. And so there were uh, several of us, me including, that uh, we were assigned mm -hmm. at Hyannis Port. So therefore, we were assigned to Mrs. Kennedy and the two children any time that they were there. So that's, that's how that came to be. Mm -hmm. She was uh, rode horses. That was one of her things that she did. So did no, you ride no. with her from time to time? As, as a matter of fact, uh, no, I did not. I did not ride horseback with her at all. Uh, I was there and I was on the spot at the time, but uh, as, a, as, a, as a matter of fact, uh, the, I, I, I can't tell you about that. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's right. That's right. But it's just one of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's go to the uh, Kennedy visit to Fort Worth. At what time, uh, when roughly did you learn that the Kennedys uh, were coming to Texas? I think we first got the uh, information that, that, that the Kennedys were planning to come to Texas was in October. And uh, so that's Im immediately when we heard that there was a rumor. Anytime you hear a rumor in the Secret Service, you, you move on it because you never know whether it's going to happen or not, but you want to be there and, and have it uh, set up. When it does happen, and so it was, uh, it was about the third week in in October, I believe, when we first got the rumor that he may be coming to Texas. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. if he's coming to Texas, then what better place would he come to than Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, Houston? So we all of the places like that that we, if we had an office in uh, San Antonio. We, we uh, uh, notified the office, be ready for it. We don't know what's going to happen, but we'll let you know as soon as we can. It was uh, uh, kind of like for your eyes only type thing. And so it was the same thing with Houston, and it was the same thing with Fort Worth and Dallas. It's interesting how that they, uh, that they did come to Fort Worth because of the fact that they were going to make one stop in, Dow in, in uh, uh, De uh, Texas uh, at first. And the information that we got was that, uh, well, we don't know which city it's going to be, but uh, they're going to just they're just going to make one stop. At first, they were said we're not even going to make a stop in uh, Texas. 
we're going to let uh, Vice President Johnson handle the campaigning and the vote getting for uh, the Democratic Party for president uh, in his hands. But uh, there were some of the Democrats that were that were in the higher echelon said that won't do. That won't do. There are, there are people down there that they are their LBJ people, but they are anti Kennedys because of two things. One of them was that he was a Catholic, and the other was that he was from Massachusetts. Hmm. Well, the people from Texas weren't about to uh, support somebody from Massachusetts and, and a Catholic. So this was a, a, a pretty big problem for the Democratic Party. So they met with, uh, with the Kennedys and, and, uh, and with the Johnsons too to decide what they should do. And so they decided, okay, we will, on our way to California, we will meet with uh, 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 someone in Texas. We'll either go to one of the big cities and that's what we'll do. So they, just, they, they decided at that time, and I didn't set in on the meeting, but we got the report back from them. They decided we'll stop over in, in Houston. That seems to be the, the big place the, for the most votes, and so we'll stop at, at uh, Houston. Well, we had a, a congressman down in San Antonio that just literally had a, uh, a, a, a tizzy, if you will. He said, no, no, he said, you, you don't understand. He said, I have the uh, Hispanic or Mexican vote here, and said, we need to have the Kennedys to come to uh, San Antonio because those people want to see them. They want to meet them. And so they said, okay. So we'll make one little stop in Houston, and then we'll go over to San Antonio. And so uh, that's what they had planned, all right? So when they did that, the, uh, the people from uh, Dallas, the congressman from Dallas said, you can't do that. You can't come to Texas and not come to Dallas. Well, they said, well, what are we gonna do? So they started figuring out their times and, and how many days this was gonna take before they could get to uh, to uh, California. So uh, then all of a sudden, guess what? Jim Wright, mm -hmm. who was our congressman here in Fort Worth, he said, let me tell you something, buddies. Well, he, he just made it right up close. He said, they're not coming to Dallas and not come to, to Fort Worth. You can forget it. They've got to come to Fort Worth if they're going to Dallas. Well, that was the end of that. So now then, they had four different cities they had to go to. Then all of a sudden, Jake Pickle, who was a congressman that had taken uh, LBJ's place down in, in, uh, in Austin, he threw a little fit too. He said, wait a minute, the capital of Texas is Austin, and that's my territory, and they need to go there. Okay, now we have five places. So they put up an itinerary that you wouldn't believe, and when they sent it to our office, I was assigned to the Dallas office at the time, by the way. Uh, I had come back from the White House detail, and I was assigned to Dallas. So when they showed me that, I said, how in the world are they going to do this thing? So they decided that they would go to San Antonio, uh, go to uh, uh, Houston. They would do a little uh, a brunch type thing. Then they'd whip over to San Antonio. They'd do a lunch type thing. Mm -hmm. And then they, they would whip up to Fort Worth. And they would stay all night there and then have a little breakfast the next morning there, a Democratic breakfast, uh, the, the 22nd day of November on Friday. And then they would fly over to Dallas, uh, do a lunch there at the, at the hall, uh, the big market hall there. And then we'll whip down to Austin and do the finale there and then stay all night at uh, uh, Vice President Johnson's ranch down at Stonewall. And so that's, that was the plan. That was the itinerary. And we looked at that and we thought, how are we going to cover this? Because at that time, at that time, and it's unbelievable, but we only had 325 plus or minus agents in the Secret Service. How many today for, by comparison? Oh, 4,000? 4,000, 4, yeah. You know, it's in that, that category. Yeah, yeah. And so, how are we going to cover that? Because this, that we're talking about all the 48 states that where we had an office. There were two states we didn't have an office. Uh, then, uh, then not only that, but uh, the, the offices that we had, some of them were one and two man offices. And so to cover a, a trip like that, it's impossible because what, what, we what had- would, What would you have to do in, in each of these offices? What would they have to do 
to prepare for a visit to that city. Exactly. It, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a big deal. I mean, it really is. And so the, you have to pull in every person that you've got and you use everybody that you can uh, from uh, the local law enforcement agencies, uh, from local uh, government agencies of all kinds, local uh, agencies like Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, you, started, you started to work early and you didn't go to bed late. So anyway, it was uh, that's that's what we started to do, and we had uh, we had about 36 people, 36 agents actually assigned to the Presidential Protective Division at that time. It wasn't called that; it was the White House detail, and that's all we had up there, give or take a man. But anyway, that's uh, so they were going to have to cover all that thing. Well, that meant that they had to pull in every agent we could out of the field offices. The uh, Dallas office, they, they had enough to where they could back them up pretty good, but if they couldn't, we'd ship a couple of our guys from Dallas down there. Mm -hmm. Then they'd ship them to San Antonio to fill in. And, and the, the, you're talking about the getting ready for them. The background is that, first of all, you had to go out there and find out where they're going to stay, set up a complete security uh, station there. You had to have a command post, and you had to, if they're going to stay in a hotel, if they were going to stay on the sixth floor, you had to cover the eighth floor, uh, the seventh floor, and the fifth floor. I mean, you had to cover both floors plus the floor that they live on. That's just one of the things you had to do. Then you had to cover all the exits, all the uh, 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 fire exits uh, on every building that they were going into. The buildings around the, the hotel that they might be. You had to cover those things. You had to wipe them out completely as far as being a, a, a some place that it might have a, a, a sniper. You had to make sure all the windows were closed and have somebody to guard that building. We didn't have that kind of people, so we had to go like to the Fort Worth Police Department. I, I'll never forget, I worked with uh, Chief Hightower. Hightower, yeah. Oh, what a great guy he was. But anyhow, I went to him and I said, Chief, I got a problem and you're going to have to help me. And I told him what it was. He said, yeah, we've got a problem. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, but Chief Hightower helped me, uh, and he gave me a couple of guys to work with me while we were doing the uh, advance there in Fort Worth. My, we had three agents to, assigned here. Uh, Bill Duncan, who was out of uh, uh, Colorado, was assigned to the White House temporary at the time, and so they sent him down. He was an excellent advance man for anybody. And so he came down, and he brought a man with him, Ned Hall, and myself. And we were the Fort Worth team. And so here we hit this. Well, the first thing, uh, Bill Duncan knew that I was, had been in law enforcement here and that I worked this area. He said, you're in charge of the law enforcement liaison. Everything that has to do with, with the law enforcement and uh, protecting them uh, as far as law enforcement is concerned, you're in charge of it. You use what people you need to. You go to each and every police department, and I did. I went to every police department in Tarrant County, every one of them. And I'm not. I'm talking about Lake Worth, Benbrook, Saginaw, every, every all of them around. North Richland Hills, Richland Hills, Hearst, uh, Manfield. I had every police department in the county online, ready to go. I even used. I used the sheriff's department, which was Lon Evans, the mm -hmm. sheriff then. And I used the, I even used their uh, sheriff's posse, which oh, yeah. was a mounted group at the time. And uh, I know one of the pictures that we have uh, uh, when uh, President Kennedy came out into the parking lot and made a, a speech mm -hmm. on the morning of the 22nd, there you see this guy on horseback back there. Well, we had those guys. I had them lined all the way to Carswell Air Base. I had one of those guys on horseback somewhere at an overpass or an underpass one way or the other. So we used every, everything that we could get. You're not going to believe this, but we even used the Boy Scouts. Hmm. We used Boy Scout troops at that time to, to help us to uh, take care of security. What would, so what would you ask the, uh, the, the other police people to do, to watch for what sort of dangers? Or what, would, what would you be telling to be concerned about we had uh, we had meetings with each one of them uh, on and when on one occasion I had the uh, chief of police and one of uh, his people to come with him from each one of these places and we would discuss 
what do you look for if you're looking for someone that might be uh, an assassin or might be a suspect? And so we would discuss that, and I'd go through all the things that I had learned and I had uh, gone to school for in Washington. What do you look for? And that's what we went through. And when we got through with that, they'd go back and they would tell their people, this is what you look for. Look out, look out for anybody that looks like that they're out of place. Mm -hmm. Today, we would refer to them, and, and, and I would never have done this in this day. Today, we would call them scumbags. Mm -hmm. But now, but at that time, mm -hmm. they were people that might be or might not be mentally deranged people, people that had had problems mentally before, mm -hmm. people that had made a statement against uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson or a statement against uh, President Kennedy. Uh, you know, it, any any least bit of a statement, uh, Mrs. J. Lee Johnson. Hmm. You talk about a great lady. Now, listen, I loved where I would have worked with her every day if I could have because she was such a great and lovely lady. But anyhow, she had had someone call her home because her name was Johnson, and they thought maybe that uh, that uh, one of the girls, one of the the uh, uh, vice president's daughters lived out there because they, I don't know. But she called and we picked those people up. I mean, we interviewed them, talked to them real nice and all that, but we got a, a, a police officer from Fort Worth, from one of uh, Chief Hightower's people. That's your person. I mean, all through this trip, you make sure you know where that person is gonna be because he had made some derogatory statement about one of the Johnson girls. It had nothing to do with President Kennedy or our, our Vice President Johnson, but it could. We didn't. We didn't. Uh, we didn't back away from anything that might suggest that somebody was. So this is what you were doing in those five days. Yes, before more more, more, more than more five, five days. days. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We started. Uh, we started out when we first started working on it. It was. Uh, it was fourteen days exactly. Fourteen days when the three of us. Uh, Bill Duncan, Edno, and me got uh, got down here, and we hit Fort Worth. We had already sat down, and we'd lined out everything that we were going to do. All right, Ed, you're going to you're going to go see the Chamber of Commerce. You're going to be uh, with the uh, people that do radio, television, and then uh, Bill Duncan was the lead man, so he was covering all of it. Who decided that the Hotel Texas would be used for the the breakfast and used for the overnight stay? For the agents, you mean? Or, well, did the agents, who selected the Hotel Texas to be the place where the uh, breakfast event was mm -hmm. and and where the Kennedys was would stay? Was that the Secret Service? Democratic, Democratic Party. I the believe that was Governor you, Conley you, made that pick. Yeah. Who, who was it? Governor Conley. Governor Conley, okay. Yeah. So that, it Governor was, Conley it, picked it, yeah. Yeah, that's the. Uh, of course, he knew Fort Worth anyway because he had lived here too. And, oh yeah, that's right. And, and that was the biggest hotel in town at the time. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh, uh, what was the the Democratic leader Beck? Wouldn't it be? Well, now the I think you may be thinking of the Chamber of Commerce president Raymond Buck. Buck, Buck, Buck. 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 Yeah. I'm sorry, that's who it was. Yeah. Yeah. But he was in on this. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. was on, and he thought it was a good suggestion, and he thought it was a good place. So, so we hit the Texas Hotel, and that scared those people to death. You're gonna what? <laughs> You're going to take over our dining room. You're going to take over this. You're going to take. A, sorry, that's just one of those things. Well, the, the Secret Service badge in those days did mean a whole lot. Yeah. And when we showed them that badge, well, I, I, I'll, I'll show you just how it, it looked to them. I mean, if you took out the badge and you held it like this, you said, "You see this? This is a commission with the United yeah. States Secret Service. I've had the authority to arrest you. I have the authority." to put you away if I need to. And so you need to cooperate cooperate with us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'd have to talk, most of the time they were great. I mean, you just said, would you please help us? Can you help us with this thing? Oh yes, we would love to help you. Oh, the Kennedys are coming here. And the Secret Service, and it was, a, it was, a, it was, elect, it was almost electrifying when you mentioned the Kennedys. Yeah. And even even uh, Vice President Johnson, although he was well known in Fort Worth, mm -hmm. even Vice President Johnson, uh, his name woke some people up. Yeah. And and Governor Conley. Con uh, yeah, Conley had lived here. Oh yeah. And had worked for Sid Richardson for a number of years. For a so number he, of years, yes, he so had. He was uh, a well known figure here. 
Yes, he was. I, I believe one of your jobs here was to uh, secure a limousine to transport the president from Carswell Air Base downtown oh, yeah. and back oh, yeah. again. How did you find a car for him to use? That was not an easy thing to do. The thing of it is, at that time, we only had a couple of cars in Washington that we that we took with us different places. They were they were considered the armored cars. Armored cars in those days were not anything. They wouldn't even come close to being the armored car today. And so we only had two that might be worthy of being called an army, uh, an armored car. We didn't, of course, because the fact that he stopped at Houston and then he jumped over to San Antonio, we had to have the other car over at San Antonio. Well, San Antonio then, they couldn't get to Fort Worth to save their life. So we had to have a car here in Fort Worth. That came, that, this was Mike's detail. And so they said, Mike, you know the people around here, find us a car. Uh, Bill Duncan told me, he said, go find us a car. Mm -hmm. So I went over to the Lincoln Mercury place. And I went to, to the dealer there and I told him my problem. And I said, Ed, do you have anything we could use? Because we had used their Mercury's and Lincoln's before. And they, they would, uh, any time that, uh, that uh, the Johnsons would come to Fort Worth, we'd borrow a car from the Lincoln place. <sighs> Mr. Howard, we don't have anything in stock right now. I don't have a thing. And about that time, this gentleman drove into the service area in a white Lincoln convertible. And I said, well, whose is that? <laughs> and he said, yes, we can talk to that man. <laughs> so they took me over and introduced me to him. And of course, that just... I mean, I, I almost uh, I, it was just fantastic to, to get to meet this man because it was Ben Hogan. I mean, he's the guy that won the Colonial three yeah, times yeah, in a row yeah. after he had a wreck and was crippled up. Yeah. And so I introduced myself and showed him my ID and all, and he said, what can I do to him? And I said, I need your car. I said, what? He said, you need my car? And I said, yes, we are out of cars. And I said, we don't have anything. We need an open car for them to be here in Fort Worth. They left to go from Carswell into town and, and then back out to Carswell the next day. And he said, take it. You know, he would just back off and take it. So we turned it over to the service department and I told them, this is a bad thing to do at the service department. Do anything it needs to make it up to snuff. Was there a bubble top for that or what? No, there wasn't, there wasn't anything. I mean, just anything. a convertible. That Separated. was it. It was just a convertible. That's all. Yeah. And, uh, but it needed shocks. Uh, it need, of course, it needed all kinds of, of uh, repair, and they, they did a complete detail on it. It looked like a brand new car. I hope Ben thanked you. Ben said thanks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> anyway, but that's what we had to use for the president and, and Mrs. Kennedy when they came to uh, Fort Worth. What were the it? other cars that were? The other cars? The other were, limousines. They, they, were, they were Lincolns. Lincolns. The ones that we had. And uh, of course, the one that was in Houston got flown to Dallas. Uh -huh. The one that was in San Antonio was going over to Austin. So, you know, they were here. And here we just had the one that went to Dallas was the bubble top, the bubble, if yeah. you will. Yeah. So, that's, mm -hmm. But that's how we uh, selected a car for uh, President Kennedy. So were you at Carswell when uh, the Kennedys arrived? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. That was my job. I was yeah. the liaison man for that. And of course, I had all the, the law enforcement. In fact, a minute, I kept Lon Evans with me night and day. Hmm. He was the sheriff and, and I knew that he could get a hold of all these police departments and help me to get these things lo uh, located. And so when we went to uh, Carswell Air Base and checked it out, he went with me. We got together with the uh, Provo Marshal there, who is the pol police chief for the right. Air Force. So anyway, we were all set. Well, when they landed, you wouldn't believe. Here it was. It was about 1130 at night and pouring down rain. Well, we had planned on going into town with a convertible. Mm -hmm. so now we had to put the top up. So we put the top up. We got them in the car and and started into town and uh, it was pretty slow going because it was really really raining hard there must have been ten thousand people and I, i'm just estimating because i've never seen that many people out on the street to see jackie to see president kennedy as they drove into town as we drove them into town and, and all the way through benbrook i mean uh uh through uh, river oaks yeah and those yeah. places out there we can run through and there are people all over the all, all over the street, and uh, I wasn't in the car. I was in the lead car, 
And so, uh, but the, the, the man that was in the front seat of the car was Roy Kellerman. And Roy said that the president said to Mrs. Kennedy, said, would you believe this? People coming out here like this to see us in the rain and they're soaking wet. And so they rolled the windows down and actually stuck out and, and were waving at people because we were going by. And so when they did that, well, I was hanging about halfway out of the, the lead car because how am I going to get to them if something happened? So I'm soaking wet too now. Uh, I, I never did send them my cleaning bill, by the way. But anyway, so we got down to the Texas Hotel and started unloading them. And they were, they were just, Mrs. Kennedy's hair was just soaking wet. And, and I think you have that picture of, of us getting into the elevator. And, and uh, her hair is just really matted and wet. I've got, I've got that picture for you if you want it. But uh, anyhow, the president's wet. Uh, John Connolly is wet. Uh, the uh, uh, the agent in charge was in wet, so we were all soaking wet. But we got got them close to the elevator and, and ready to go up. And my thought was, get them in the suite, get them in the suite as soon as you possibly can, because it's dark outside and this kind of mess. It's almost impossible to spot somebody. I mean, you're looking for somebody that might want to do something. And in and, and a rainstorm like that, it was just, I mean, I was, it was a nightmare. Because you lobby packed with people. And the lobby was oh, okay. packed with people. There must have been yeah. however many people you could get into the lobby. And they mm -hmm. were, they were packed. And they were holding out, would you sign this? Would you sign this? Not only the sign, but if you had on that uh, uh, tie like yeah, you have yeah, there. The bolo, yeah, yeah. If they could get it off of him, they would. They yeah, wanted yeah. souvenirs. Soon and they yeah. would buttons off of off a coat yeah, yeah. they'd reach try to pull a button off and of course that was your job to push them back but anyhow they were signing or, or they had autograph or they'd put their initials or something and mrs kennedy was doing it had the brightest smile on her face and as you can see in in our pictures that we have it uh, she was just really radiant i mean yeah. she was outstanding and and president uh, uh kennedy had mentioned to one of the fellows after that that uh, boy wasn't she great mm -hmm. i mean she really was great Finally, we get them into the suite. And, well, and can I talk fun. about the room selection because that's the 850. Uh, actually, was not the the biggest room in the in the, the hotel. So, uh, how was that selection made? That in we, 850? they didn't, didn't. We didn't like the uh, the uh, 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 room that we should have had. Would have been the presidential suite, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the Will Which, Rogers suite. The, I guess. Yeah, the, yeah, the Will yeah, the Will Rogers. That was there. They Will Rogers. It, they called it the presidential yeah. suite, but it was the real one. But uh, it was facing the wrong direction. It, uh, it uh, on the outside there was too too much uh, view from from another building, and so we can't use this. And so we Secret Service, uh, the, the, in fact, uh, Bill Duncan, who was in charge of it, he he got us together and he said, guys, let's take a look at some of the others, and that's how come 850 was picked. And if you know, and, and you know how it's got kind of an L shape mm -hmm. on it, well, that's that that it, it worked out good, mm -hmm. and uh, but it, and it wasn't nearly as nice as the other suite. Oh yeah. Oh, it, it wasn't. Well, so did, were the uh, the other rooms on uh, eight hundred, were they then unoccupied or how? Did, what kind of security was okay on, on that floor? What what we usually do and what we did there, the the uh, the rooms above eight fifty. We had people out of there, or we had the Secret Service detail that was in them. Mm -hmm. The same way on uh, uh, the eighth floor, we had the president's uh, aides and the people that worked with him, and his number two people on the on the Secret Service detail were there. And uh, then on the same thing, underneath 850 on the seventh floor, we had somebody uh, from the staff or from the, the Secret Service down there. Or it could be from Waka. We had people there from uh, uh, Waka that that were a lot. Uh, that's Waka is White House Communications mm -hmm. Association. Uh, and uh, anyway, we had people from them, so we would put them in those. That's how you covered it. That's the only way you could cover them. Yeah. So you we really tried. took off, took a good portion of the oh, yeah of, of the hotel. Yeah. Cook a chunk out of the hotel. Did, uh, did you have security around then the elevators they use so that? You had a, a secret service person on the. We elevator. had a we had a we had a secret service person on the, the elevators all the time that they were there. 
Mm-hmm. Nobody got on that elevator that we didn't have one of our guys on there. Mm-hmm. Now, there were because of the shortness of, our, of people that we had, we used some of uh, Chief Hightower's guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, I know, I, know uh, uh, I can't call that sergeant's name, I thought I'd never forget it, but I know he didn't appreciate it much because we signed him an elevator all night. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had to ride the darn elevator. Yeah. So he guarded the elevator. He was the elevator man, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, back to the politi- the other political leaders. Uh, the senator was there and uh, Governor Conley, uh-huh. and uh, there, there seemed to be a very big split in the, in the, the party at that time. Was this something that, that the Secret Service was aware of or became aware of? Oh, uh, listen, we, if we weren't aware of it before, we were by the time they got there. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, uh, we, we got the, the, the Kennedys into their suite, we got the Johnsons into their suite, we got uh, Governor Connolly into his suite, and uh, went back down and we were trying to get ourselves put together. Here I am, I'm soaking wet, and this, this uh, guy from the hotel runs up and said, I don't know what to do. He said, this guy's over here, he claims to be a senator, and he doesn't have a room. <laughs> and I said, he, what do you mean he doesn't have a room? We've got a room for everybody that's in the party. No, we didn't have a room for him. Well, you know who the senator was? Yes, Yarborough. (laughs) Senator Yarborough. And I went over there and I said, Senator, I'm so sorry, but I don't know why that that there's there's a mix up here. Uh, But uh, listen, we have a room for you and it's the best room in the hotel. I mean, you definitely have a room and I'll show it to you. Would you all assign him to his room? And they said, you know, what room? And (laughs) so, guess I lost my room. (laughs) So I put him in my room because, uh, and I and I bunked up when the, with uh, Bill Duncan, one of the other agents. Mm-hmm. But anyhow, uh, he was really upset. I mean, he was, uh, he, he did not like that at all uh, because he had been overlooked. Well, it, it was just a mistake on the part of the hotel because I know we had him on the list. But it, there was, uh, and, and, uh, uh, well, I can't talk out of turn as far as uh, as uh, uh, what Governor Connolly and what uh, uh, Vice President Johnson uh, had with the senator, but uh, the, I, and I don't know what the background was on it, but there just was a. I mean, they were cold. There, there was no love lost. Oh yeah. Well, just as you were saying earlier, I mean, the reason for this whole trip was to keep or try to keep Texas. For Kennedy in the next election. That's right. And so the unity yes. of the the party was terribly it, important. It really was important, and I was surprised. That a senator is a senator. I was surprised that the Democratic Party did not have somebody assigned to him. Mm. I mean, he he's a senator. I don't care if he's liked or not. Yeah. And I was kind of surprised at that. Um, but I, who am I? I'm a lowly Secret Service agent of GS11, mm. and uh, who cared what I thought. Well, so you did finally get a room, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. I gave him a room. Yeah, but no, he got a room, but did you get a room? Oh, I, I, I bunked in with uh, 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 oh, uh, uh, Bill Duncan, who was the head of our uh, advanced detail there. I had an extra bed in his room. He said, don't worry about it. Bunk in with me, and so that's what we did. Well, tell us more about that, that evening with the agents, because that was, I guess, was it uh, a, a D.C. columnist made a big deal out of what happened, uh, I guess, later that night. Uh, could you tell us about what happened? There, were, there were two things happened that, uh, that caused uh, uh, some controversy, if you will. If you're a newsman, if you're a newsman, there's a little bit of controversy, and that was, now, the agents hadn't had anything to eat because they had gone, uh, they had hit uh, Houston, they'd hit uh, San Antonio, and they were, they were, they hit the airplane running. And so they hadn't had anything. They hadn't sat down to a meal at all. And so guess what? The coffee shop at the Texas Hotel was closed. There wasn't a place to get anything to eat. The only place that, was, that we knew, uh, us advanced people, knew had something to eat was over in the hotel down the street that the news media had. The news media had the hotel down the street. What was the hotel down the street? Is it the Blackstone? Blackstone, yeah. Blackstone. Yeah, the Blackstone, okay. Mm-hmm. So they had this huge suite, and they had this spread of sandwiches and, and all the stuff that go with it, and drinks of all kinds. And so I said, well, come on, I don't know where we can get something to eat. It's my job to get those guys something to eat. So I took them down to the Blackstone. It's quit raining a little bit. 
And so we uh, and wasn't worried about getting wet because I was already soaked. But it, nevertheless, we went down to the Blackstone and went up the street. And of course, the news people said, well, well sure, cram on in. By that time, they, there was a bunch of them that were just teetotaled because they were hitting it pretty hard. Which, they, and I'm, I'm sorry, but they, they did that. I mean, the news media were pretty bad about, about hitting the bottle. I mean, they just really did. Do you think it helped them write more creatively? You think? I don't know. That may be one. That's out of my department. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. That's okay. out of my department. I'm not going to touch that one with a 10-foot pole. But, but anyhow, they were just they were just uh, really gracious about uh, uh, them having sandwiches. So they did. The guys got a sandwich, and they got a and, – and the thing about it is ginger ale and, and 7-Up were the drink of the day when you're in when you're in travel status with the Secret Service, and so you pick up a, a, a glass of ice and you pour a ginger ale in. And you're walking around carrying that glass. Okay, what color is ginger ale? Okay, okay what color is scotch? Yeah. And so lo and behold, lo and behold, some of these guys picked up on that, and later on, after the assassination, well, hell's bells! Those guys were drinking. I saw them, mm -hmm. and they were drinking ginger ale. But you think they, people are going to believe it? That's the thing. They, they just didn't. And when they had, they had to write reports on it. What were you drinking? What were you? Every agent that was there had to write a report on it, including myself. And I was, I was drinking Seven Up, but uh, that, that's just one of those things. But anyhow, everybody had to write a, a, a note. Then though, is uh, and uh, you had discussed this a while ago. or said something about it. But uh, they had heard of the seller. Well, the seller, as, as you know. What was the guy's name that owned that? It was, uh, he was a uh, well-known. Uh, oh yeah, he was uh, around. And, yeah, and, uh, okay, one of us. Kind of, yeah, you yeah, come out. You come by. Yeah, three yeah. o'clock in the morning. You give me a call. But anyway, <laughs> he did. He had this. He had put in this cellar, and what it was, it was called the cellar because this uh, hardware store directly across the the parking lot from the Texas Hotel had a a cellar, a, a basement. And so he called it the cellar, and he painted the whole wall was black. I mean, the side of the building was black with great big white letters, cellar. And had an arrow pointed to the stairs, and the stairs went in from downstairs. Well, the, uh, one of the guys heard about it and said, uh, hey, could you tell us where this cellar is? You don't want to go over there. We'd like to see it. And it, it's a coffee. I said, it's just a coffee junk. I mean, it's junkies and stuff like that are down there. Oh man, let's go look at that. So they wanted to go see it. So anyhow, we did. We took them over there and we walked through and, and you could smell what was going on in there. There wasn't any doubt that there was somebody smoking pot and this sort of thing. And you had these little guys over in the corner playing their mandolins and singing songs like Mary Had a Little Lamb and things like that. And But they had this coffee. And, and uh, if you've ever <laughs> drank coffee at these coffee houses, you know it's just syrup. <laughs> and it's just terrible. But nevertheless, one of the guys took a taste of it and he said, I don't know what's so great about this. And so we stayed there about five minutes while they watched the people go around. And the girls that were there, they were kind of, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, how were they dressed. They were kind of scantily dressed, you know, they weren't they weren't going to a ball or anything. So anyway, we walked out of there and, and all the agents from, from Washington, they were, they were laughing and going on about it. But we had a newsie with you. We had a newspaper guy with us. I don't know which one it was. But anyhow, went back over to the hotel and they all decided it was time they got to bed. By that time, it was about 1.30 in the morning. Well, I got out of those wet clo clothes and, uh, and uh, hung them in the, in the uh, uh, shower or in the bathroom to where I could get them dried off enough to put them on. I didn't bring another suit of clothes down here. I'm, I'm not very smart, I mean. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, uh, about uh, 4.30 in the morning, I got back in those clothes and so we were on duty trying to get the, uh, uh, the, the breakfast all set up. And we went down and of course the, the hotel people were working like uh, crazy, getting, them, getting the, the room all set and getting the room, the uh, uh, podium all set. And so the, and by that time we had, we, of course we had guards on all the uh, fire escapes. We had a fireman on every fire escape. We had a, a policeman on every door going to the fire escape. A policeman of some kind, a law enforcement. We had constables, we had deputy constables, we had everything in the world. From even from as far out as Hearst, Texas, we had a 
police officers in there. So anyhow, my job was to check and make sure they were there. By the time I made that whole run, it took me a good hour and a half just to make that run. By that time, it was about six o'clock and people had already begun to, to arrive. The breakfast was supposed to be at eight and people were outside the doors of the, of the banquet hall looking in to see you know, what was the weather like at that point in time? It was still drizzling rain. Still rain. It was still drizzling rain. And uh, so anyway, uh, by that time, by the way, I, uh, I uh, uh, had three VIPs that I had to uh, get into the uh, uh, banquet room and get them seated in their seats close to the, where the president was going to be speaking from. But anyhow, then uh, when, uh, by the time the doors opened, the people rushed in and they headed for these seats and, and these, uh, the, the people of, of Fort Worth, Tarrant County or wherever they came from, they were dressed the best they had. They were Sunday go to meet clothes, mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. they, had, uh, they had their fur coats on, they had their fur wraps on and, and jewelry was sparkling all over and, and so anyhow, we had every chair was full and then we had standing room only on the outside. We had to clear the area behind the chairs and, and, and put them outside. Did they, were the people allowed then into the mezzanine or to the ballroom before then Kennedy spoke outside then? Uh, he spoke, he gave his first speech outside uh -huh. before going into the uh, the ballroom. So, and, and you were with him then when they went outside. Yes, right? yeah. yes, yeah. yes, uh, and, and there were people out there but the people that were in the in the banquet room were not going to give up their seat. Yeah. So they they didn't follow us out. Yeah. So anyhow, we went outside and and by that time it was just clearing off. Mm -hmm. It was just. Mm -hmm. and so and what did he? It was on the on a, a trailer bed or. or yeah, it was it was uh, actually I, I I I can't tell you exactly what it was, uh, but I think that it was a, a short trailer. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I didn't set it up, so I'm not sure what it was. But anyhow, I know when he stepped up on there with the other people, John Connolly and, and Vice President Johnson and, and uh, uh, Senator, what's his name again? Oh, Yarbrough. See, I forget that yeah. every once in a while. <laughs> Senator Yarbrough. Was, I, I forget uh, names too. Well, right, well no, I, I forgot it because he's not supposed to be there. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. he was there. But uh, They were all up on this trailer, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so the president started to make his little talk. He didn't talk long, but he, he said some things that people like to hear because I could hear him cheering behind me. But, but of course, I was standing almost directly in front of, of where he was speaking, and I was looking out at the crowd. You know, we don't look at the people that are speaking. We look at the people that's out in the crowd. And so I was scanning the crowd by this time and, and looking for a bad guy. And uh, because it was uh, something that was uh, not on the program, then you know, it, you know, I was a little bit concerned, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I was concerned from this standpoint. Right across the uh, uh, street from the hotel, there is an office building, and it was a, a, a law offices. And the day before, I had been over there to check it out, and because we saw windows open up there, and we saw what looked like somebody uh, looking outside, looking out the window. Well, I went over with a policeman and we went up the back stairs. We didn't go up and in the elevator. We went up the back stairs, got up there, and here's these three young boys, teenagers, and one of them had a rifle with a scope on it, and he was looking through there, looking at all those people. Oh, my there. goodness. Uh, well, yeah. his father was, a, was an attorney and kept his deer hunting rifles in a, in a case there, and the case was open. And so we uh, apprehended them and uh, took them face we weren't doing anything, we were just looking and said, do you know, realize what could have happened? If, the, if we had had one of our anti-snipers over there, you could you could be dead now. Mm -hmm. But I said, fortunately for you, we saw you ahead of time. And and so we, we got a hold of his father and uh, and when we closed that thing down, we closed that building down, we closed those windows down. And <laughs> I thought, how many more attorneys have their deer rifles in their office, yeah. you know, because yeah. that's how scary it was. So, so were all the windows supposed to be closed? Yes. In? So that was by Absolutely. the Secret Service order. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We, we ordered it, and we had, uh, uh, I had to borrow one of uh, Mr. Hightower's borrows again. I had, I don't know, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he was a motorcycle 
Cooper and I, and uh, he was he was a friend of mine, and I'm pretty sure that he was the one that was assigned to that building, and so he stayed with it uh, mm -hmm. from the next morning on. Mm -hmm. So then next, uh, the Kennedys and the entourage went in, and and uh, the presentation of the chamber was made. Where were you in the room at that time, and what were, what was the assignment of Secret Service in that room? In the in the uh, uh, where they were eating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was I was down at the far end. We had this great big uh, uh, speaker stand, if you will, that went nearly the full length across there because they had all these dignitaries. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Buck, for instance, yeah. was on it, and and then all these other uh, dignitaries were there. And so, I I was down at the far end where the steps went up, and so it was my job to make sure that nobody went up those steps, and and also to make sure that I could see all out in the crowd. Uh, you don't know. You don't know how uh, uh, what it can do to you to think I'm standing here and I've got to see this guy if he's out there. And listen, that does something to you. When when these things are over, when you have a a, a, a party like this, it's over. It takes you a while to cool down, mm. to relax. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised that we didn't have more agents that had uh, nervous breakdowns because of, mm -hmm. of looking for that one guy that might take out your president or your vice president. Well, anyway. and, you, and you mentioned how many hours uh, before you had a break. Yes. It could be. Yes. So, uh, uh, so how many hours might that have been before you, before you had they, a break from duty? That's right. I, I had had about two hours sleep in the last three days. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, the. The, the only time that I would get a nap would be if somebody else was driving. Mm -hmm. And I'd take a nap in the car if we, if we were checking out something. And we, like if we were going to go from the hotel out to Carswell Air Base to check out something, I might, I might be sitting over in the right-hand seat, but I'd be taking a nap on the way out there. Mm -hmm. So that's the only uh, sleep that we actually got during that time. And I hadn't, hadn't had a decent night's sleep, but I didn't win. Yeah. But that that's, was just part of it. And, and uh, we... Uh, uh, we had people. We had people about ten feet apart, all the way across the the, uh, the speaker's platform. But I guess your biggest worry was things like out in front, where there are vast areas and yeah. buildings and things That's like right. that. Like yeah. like I was talking about that okay. building over there. That if we if I looked up and seen a window open yeah. there and the president standing there speaking. It would have been a bad situation. Well, let's finish a little bit on the the breakfast. Mm. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy wasn't there at the very beginning. Can you describe her entrance to the breakfast? Yeah. It was it was it was interesting, and and I guess Martha could probably tell you more about that because everybody in there was looking for Jackie, and you could hear the, the vibration mm -hmm. over the room. Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. Jackie. They, they wanted to know where she was. They were chanting. They were chanting. They were actually yeah. chanting. Jackie. Where were you sitting, Mrs. Howard? In the breakfast. Um, I was fairly close. Fairly to close the, to the yeah, front. Yeah, over right. on. If you're looking at the, <clears throat> the podium on mm -hmm. the left hand side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did What do you remember about when she entered the room? What happened? What was? <clears throat> it was just explosive. Mm -hmm. People, some of the ladies, stood on their chairs so that oh they could goodness. get a better view of Jackie. <laughs> well, we have in the exhibit we, we're putting together things and one of the artifacts that we uh, have is a, a chair, a folding chair from the Hotel Texas. So uh, knowing what the folding chairs are like, I, I hope no one fell off the chairs standing <laughs> they there. They probably did. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't know about it. Oh, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and you remember the, uh, the clothing she had. I mean, there's much been said about the outfit that she had on. And, yeah. And I guess it was the, the pink and, mm -hmm. and uh, Mike. I know you were you were in close proximity to the president yeah. at several points that morning. You know, being one of the people that surrounded him as he moved through the crowd and that sort of thing. Did he speak to you at all? Did you have any any interaction with the president that day? Yeah. Did he say anything did he say to me? Did to I you? say how you doing, Bud? Exactly. <laughs> no. 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 There wasn't any conversation. He just he was just smiling mm -hmm. and, and uh, mm -hmm. I I did. I was the I was the point man there at, at one time on the outside there where we went outside and and uh, so I did I motioned him this way to come this way, mm -hmm. and because I was going to lead him to that platform that they had set up, so that's Out in the, the only lot. that's yeah that was the only conversation that I had with him was that 
let's go, you know. But, let's, uh, let's back up. One, one thing we haven't talked about was the room with the artwork. Oh, yeah. Uh, where, when did you become aware of this beautiful original artwork that was placed in the room? Did you know it at the time? Uh, well, I knew it was coming because, well, once again, uh, Mrs. J. Lee Johnson, I, had, I was working with her, and she was doing a lot of decorating in there. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mean, so the first time I, I ever saw her was that I walked into the, uh, the, to the suite and she was standing up on one of the couches up like this in her sock feet, you know, and I thought, who is this woman? You know, and that's how I met J Mrs. J. Lee Johnson. But anyhow, uh, uh, that was about, I guess it was uh, Wednesday, about a, couple, about a couple of days when they started putting all that stuff in there. At, uh, or hanging it, yeah. you know. They had, they had they had a bunch of stuff in there, but they didn't have it up on the wall yet. And so then, when they started hanging it up on the wall, I I didn't recognize some of them. I mean, I, that that was definitely out of my department. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, some of those art. So things. when did when did you discover the value of or the importance of of the artwork? I, well, I, I have to tell you this. I I don't know that I even thought about the value of it. You know, it's it's kind of like the value of a life. Mm -hmm. uh, we never thought about the value of it. It's mm -hmm. just uh, I didn't realize that uh, that uh, this painting was worth this much. That this one's worth this much. Uh, I, I don't know. I just didn't give it a thought. Yeah. But I, I, later on, then when I heard about it, I thought, "Wow!" You know. Yeah. Well, Scott has been such a, a a wonderful person to have done the research on this week. You might want to just add some words about uh, about that. Yeah. Well, since the first time I met Mike, we did come up with some color photography of Sweet 850. So we got a good look at the, the scheme, you know, the decor decoration scheme as it actually did look. And it was a real curious mix of colors and, and furniture. It was very odd, oddly furnished. And so it was a little easier to understand when you actually saw what it really looked like. Why? There would have been an, an, an well, idea had, to what, redecorate chi some Chinese motif. Well, the, it was uh, the the newspapers referred to the decorative scheme as Chinese modern because they didn't know what to call it. <laughs> yeah. So they just made it up, you yeah. know, Chinese modern. And then you think about well, that Chinese like modern. What is that? Yeah. You know? yeah. and, that sounds like a news media. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, <laughs> Chinese <laughs> modern. Yeah. 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 There you go. So it was easy to understand why they uh, there was some uh, impetus to spiffy it up, make it nicer yeah, than yeah, it, than it yeah. was, since they did have to be moved from the presidential suite, the first presidential suite, yeah. down to the eighth floor. It was, it's easy to see why somebody wanted to make it better than it was. Yeah. Well, and the great thing is, uh, and, and, uh, through, and uh, because of Scott's interest and in research on this, now there is the exhibit, which at this moment is at, in Dallas and will be coming mm -hmm. to the Amon Carter. and. And uh, Ruth Carter Stevenson, mm -hmm. uh, the woman you were just referring to, uh, uh, you know, there were uh, there was artwork from there, and then she, you know, brought the was part of the ones to literally hang the artwork yeah. in that room. So, uh, so really, the uh, it's it's a a wonderfully, you know, important and and uh, very, you know, human story. Mrs. Stevenson was J Mrs. J. Lee Johnson back in those days yeah, when Mike very, first yeah. met her. And, and he, he mentioned when he walked in the suite and he saw a lady standing in a, on a sofa in her socks, yeah, yeah. hanging a painting. And there was a reason why she was in her socks, because the housekeeper made everybody going into Suite 850 <laughs> take their shoes off. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. there were so many people in and out of there, yeah. they couldn't keep the carpets yeah. clean. And she yeah. got tired yeah. of trying to keep the carpets clean, so she required everybody except the Secret Service keep your shoes, keep your shoes take off. their shoes yeah. off. And I tried not to go in because of that. I just stand in the door because I didn't want this little lady to beat me over the head with this broom she had. Uh, well, then, after the, the speech was completed uh, to the, ch the Chamber of Commerce, then I guess the Kennedys went back to the room, mm -hmm. and then, then you took them to Carswell. Why don't you tell a little bit about the, yeah. what happened next? Well, uh, one thing, uh, as Martha said, when, when she came into the room, if the people just it was bedlam, and they were. Then, of course, being in Texas, you're going to have some people to whistle. Yeah. And we had, <laughs> we had, we had guys out there that were, and I say guys, they were just people just like you yeah. and I, but they were whistling, and the women were screaming and giggling and going on about, oh, look what she's wearing, look what she's uh. wearing, and, and of course I was getting a little bit nervous because I was down to the steps, you know, and I thought, 
they're going to rush us. I know they are <laughs> because of the way they were acting. And of course, if you remember, and you have a copy of the president's speech mm -hmm. about what he said, no one cares what Jackie wears, yeah. and, and he said something to Lyndon Johnson about it. Well, no one, no one cares what Lyndon and I wear. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, it. Yeah, that's that's right. what it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he turned to Lyndon and, and said that, you know, and, and it was, uh, it, of course, that turned everybody on too, and of course. The se you could tell the Secret Service agents because none of us had a smile on our face. Mm -hmm. We had we had. You didn't one. laugh at the jokes. I never laughed at the <laughs> joke. No, I, that, that wasn't my yeah. job. Yeah. Wow. Well, so then they went back to the room, and then you took them in the the Hogan. Uh, ben Hogan's car. Ben Hogan's car. Got them, got them loaded. We got them downstairs and, and got them Logan and uh, loaded, and I, I discussed what route we were going to take. Now with the three routes to go out there, and so we hadn't decided which one this was for security reasons mm -hmm. because there was a, there were people that knew that he came into Carswell and he'd probably go out to Carswell so we had not given anybody the information and so we had to give the lead uh, people in, on their motorcycles which route we're going to take and of course uh, the other people so that they would know if anything happens this is where you go I mean you got to take you might have to go around a another corner or something like that. So we had to discuss that with them. And that's what I was doing then while they were upstairs in, in the suite getting ready to go. And so we uh, we decided which route we were gonna go take. And uh, got in the car. And when, after we got them loaded, I was the last person to get in a car. And I had the car, the car was rolling and I had the back door open and I jumped in the lead car. And so we went on out to Carswell. But on the way out there, as I told you, we had uh, I had these uh, uh, people on horseback, these uh, uh, deputy sheriffs, out there along the road, and they were standing underneath the overpass and, and and on top of the overpass, in order to see that there's nobody could get around there that could get under it or over it or whatever. But we got out to uh, one place, and I want to say River Oaks, and, and and you'll have to forgive me here because my memory is a little bit fuzzy as, as to just exactly where this took place. But we started around a corner and there was just, there were hundreds of people, thousands of people out there on the road and going out towards Corsell Air Base. And all of a sudden we turned this corner and the people were all the way out in the, in the, in the street, in the highway there. It was Highway 77. Is it 77 or 377? 377. 377. 377. Yeah, anyhow, yeah. that's where we were. And anyhow, there was a policeman out there holding back people, you know. And the president wanted to stop the car. Well, I'm up in the front corner. What? You know, he wanted to stop the car because he had seen a group of school children on, out there, and there were two nuns there. It was a Catholic school that was there, <laughs> and he wanted to make sure that he recognized yeah, them. Yeah. And he actually, he actually got out of the car, walked over, and shook hands with them. And of course, here came all the children, and the next thing he knew, he was shining more art. But he got back in the car and then went on down the road. That's the only time that he got out of the car and, or even tried to get them to mm -hmm. stop. So then two cars well and on yeah. to. So, yeah. so then once he was then, well, you mentioned about you stayed at the airport or the uh, cars well until he landed then in Dallas? No, or no. Uh, we had two car, two airplanes out there. We had Air Force Two, which was Lyndon Johnson's, mm -hmm. uh, the vice president's plane, and we had uh, Air Force One. Well, they were fairly uh, uh, about 100 yards apart. But we got uh, the vice president on and, and got him in the air to get out of here, you know, and they took off. And while the president was was walking the line, you know, you had people outside the fence mm -hmm. there and it, it's, it's called walking the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we walked the line with him while he shook hands. Mrs. Kennedy and everybody else got on the plane. And then he came back and got on the plane. And when we got the message, that Air Force Two has landed at Love Field, then Air Force One took off. They were in, in position to go, but we had to give them the word that they were down, and so the men took off. And we had to wait then until they were halfway, a point of no return, before we could leave the air, uh, leave Carswell Air Base and go back. Our job then was to go back to the Texas Hotel and do a complete sweep of the suite. Mm. And so we had to go in there and make sure that there was nothing of national security or nothing that would be embarrassing to the Kennedys and the Johnsons too, as far as that goes, but we sent other people up there. But anyhow, 
So we went in and we did a complete sweep and wiped out everything in there. And then as we were leaving the room, by that time, they had, they were in the motorcade and started down a commerce and then all of a sudden, uh, some commentator, a radio commentator uh, for the TV, uh, said there's been a shot fired in Dallas. We didn't stop. I mean, ordinarily, if you, if you heard that, you'd turn to the TV. But the day the president was supposed to arrive, it was, of course, it, it wasn't raining during that day. It didn't start raining till right about dark. But during the day, uh, we were going around getting things done, you know, and, and one of the uh, policemen came up to me and said, Mr. Howard said, I think you better come over here and take a look at this. There's something wrong with this. They said, I don't, know, I don't know for sure, but I think you need to take a look at it. And I said, what? And I, of course, I'm thinking assassination looking thing or something like that. So being the treasure agent first, you know. So anyhow, I walk over and he shows me and this guy has a table set up there in the lobby of the Texas Hotel. And he has laid out there $1 bills. I mean, just, I don't know how many of them on this table. And he has another stack up here and another stack of them over here. And instead of George Washington, it's got President Kennedy and it's got Jacqueline Kennedy's picture on the, on the dollar bills, okay? So what? I, I, I said, mister, you can't do that. He said, what? And I gave him my, I showed him my ID and I said, you can't do that. That's against the federal law. I said, you know, you could get uh, from one to 10 just like that. He said, oh my gosh, he said, I didn't, I didn't mean to. I said, well, look, um, how many do you have here? I've got a hundred of each. And I said, well, I'm gonna give you a, a receipt for them. And so I gave him, I just wrote it out on a piece of paper, received from Mr. So-and-so, so-and-so, uh, uh, $200 in- uh, Counterfeit. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. it, what, I didn't call it counterfeit. Uh, <laughs> defaced. Uh, defaced, 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 defaced dollar. Oh, okay. And I said, mm -hmm. uh, if uh, now we'll contact you after this trip's over and all. I'll get I'll get in contact with you and let you know what what the uh, U.S. Attorney says about this. But uh, I said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take them right now. But I gave him a receipt for them. So I I, I took them and I put them in my briefcase. I had a briefcase of, in my room, and so. I, Went up my room and I put them in the briefcase. Didn't think anything about them. And uh, the the next time I saw those was about three weeks after that. You know, there's a lot of things happened. I, I was assigned to Marina Oswald and had her for a week during uh, right after the assassination. And then uh, I, they sent me down to uh, uh, Austin to work with uh, Linda Bird Johnson at the at the University of Texas forgot all about my, my briefcase. I hadn't even had my briefcase out. And one day I opened my briefcase and, and I had them stuck up in a little pocket mm -hmm. holder there. And I pulled those things out. Oh my gosh, I forgot all about them. You could have been arrested. I could have been arrested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could have been arrested. <laughs> one to 10. Yeah, one to 10. <laughs> one to 10. But so I so I, uh, I asked my boss, I said, Mr. Sorrells, what I'll do? And he said, you better contact this man. He said, we're not gonna charge him. And I said, okay, I'll call him and get them back to him. So I did, I called him and he said, uh, uh, almost, before I could even tell him what the U.S. attorney had said, before I could even tell him that, he said, don't worry about it, you can have them, you can have them. I don't want any part of them, I don't want any part of them. Because the president has been assassinated, uh, yeah, he yeah. thought this could really oh, yeah. be bad. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, I, I turned them into the, uh, to the office and, and there. I guess they're all in the archives with the Secret Service someplace. Oh my God! But uh, dollar bills with Jackie and yeah, yeah. and President Kennedy's yeah, picture on them, yeah. they'd be worth a fortune today, yeah. wouldn't they? Oh my goodness! <laughs> well, let's finish. It, 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 so you then heard the announcement that shots had been fired. Yeah. So then, where did you go then? What happened next? We got we got on the elevator, went downstairs. Well, uh, uh, the the sheriff was standing down there in the lobby, and I said. Uh, I need your car and I need it in a hurry. He said, sure, where are we going? And I said, well, you don't have to go. He said, yeah, I'll drive, I'll drive. So he scooted me in. And uh, so he had this, he had just gotten a brand new Ford police interceptor. And he said, this is the fastest car in the state of Texas. And I said, and he said, where are we going? And I said, well, there's been a shot fired in Dallas and we need to get there. So he took, and he had a special a speedometer on there that had down to 150. Well, we took off down the, the turnpike between Fort Worth and Dallas, 
And when we got to the first, the the the, uh, the opening there, the, where you go through the booth on the Fort Worth side, I saw this man standing in the booth, but I and I was sucked down in the seat just as far as I could get because we were running between 100 and 130 and 135 miles an hour oh. in that car. I had I had a, uh, a deputy sheriff and uh, an agent in the back seat. I had myself and another agent in the front seat, and boy, I mean, we were blasting that road. Were you nervous? No, I wasn't nervous at all. <laughs> I mean, just because I was eating up the seat cover, that doesn't mean a thing, you know. But anyhow, we went through that, and and the, this this is a this is a true story. In in those days, they had a wire that set up about this far, to, um, far enough to hit a bumper on any vehicle, where you went through there, and it clicked. So it marked it, it was counting what it did. About uh, oh, two weeks later, after uh, everything was over, I came through there and I had to present my badge in order to get a ticket so I didn't have to pay to go through there. But he said, hey, were you in that car that came through that so fast? And I said, I said, yeah, I'm sorry about that. And he said, I got something for you. And he came out and he brought this wire with a piece of asphalt on, on the bottom, we had jerked that thing completely oh out God. of the ground because we'd been driving so fast it hit that thing. Oh. <laughs> well, anyhow, we got to the hospital. We, of course, on the, the police radio, we found that they'd go to Parkland Hospital. We got there, and of course, there was Bedlam over there. There were policemen standing out there with guns in their hands, pointed at the crowd, you know, and they were fanning the crowd. And, hey, we're we're agents. We're, we're okay now. So anyhow, so we went in and. and uh, so uh, we, some of the guys that had been in the follow-up car were in the, in the hall right outside the uh, OR. And so we talked to them for a minute and we found out about uh, uh, John Connolly. Uh, he's doing okay, but he's in a uh, pretty bad condition. And uh, I said, well, how about the, the vice president? Well, he's okay. He said, he's bruised up pretty good. Why is he bruised up? What happened was Rufus Youngblood was the agent that was with him at the time. And uh, so when that first shot hit, Rupus was in the front, right front seat, and he jumped over the back seat, vaulted over, is what President Johnson said later, and grabbed him and threw him down in the floor, pushed him down the floor, and got on top of him. He did exactly what he was trained to do. So anyhow, uh, uh, that's, what, that's what had happened there, but anyway, we, uh, uh, I went over to see how he was. I just walked down the hall because uh, 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 old, uh, Bill Duncan, the agent with me, he was taking notes. He was taking notes because that was our job over at Fort Worth, and he was taking all kinds of notes. But anyhow, about that time, they I saw this priest come in, and I saw also uh, this hearse drove up out at the back and backed up in there. So I knew that there'd been some kind of decision made, but. I wasn't in the operating room at the time, so I didn't know. So anyhow, what they had done was that uh, they had uh, the, the uh, they had pronounced him dead, and the priest had done the, the last rites. Mrs. Kennedy was in there, but uh, I, I couldn't see her from where I was. But anyway, they uh, they they put the president into a, uh, a casket that they had brought over from the funeral home, and they put him in a in a, in a bag first. They didn't have a, a rubber bag. So they put him in a uh, mattress cover. Hmm. And they put him in the mattress cover and put him into the casket and we rolled him out there. And so we, we loaded him into the back of the hearse. And Mrs. Kennedy insisted on riding in the back of the hearse. So she and Clint Hill uh, climbed in, in the back. So meanwhile, they, they uh, uh, I, I don't know which one of the agents in charge told me but I think it was uh, Forrest Sorrells. But anyhow, he said, you stay here with the president because uh, uh, the, uh, uh, oh, I, I, I forget the name already, but the administrative aide to uh, President Kennedy went down the hall and tapped on the door and walked in and said, Mr. President, the president is dead. And he was talking to uh, President Johnson. So anyhow, they said, uh, uh, Mr. President, we'll have to, we'll need to take you to Air Force One. So President Kennedy was already on the way out there, and they loaded him on, and then uh, uh, we went in the follow-up car behind 
uh, President Johnson and went out to uh, Air Force One and, and took him aboard. So that's where we were when uh, we couldn't understand why they didn't take off. And when I went up uh, to, the, to the door to find out, they were waiting on uh, Judge Sarah Hughes to get here mm. to swear the president in. Because President Johnson did not want to go back to, uh, to uh, Washington without being sworn in. Mm -hmm. Although he was the president. Yeah. I mean, the minute the President Kennedy uh, quit breathing, he became president, but he wanted he wanted to be sworn in right there. Yeah, I think that photograph, or photographs of the swearing in on the on the Air Force One, Air Force One. was just so uh, I don't know, so dramatic and so oh, yeah. so sad and uh, oh, yeah. and yet so he, important. Yeah, he asked. Uh, in fact, he had asked uh, one of the people to get uh, uh, Mrs. Kennedy that he would like for her to be there for the swearing in. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, I was I was told later. I mean, I, I don't even remember which one. But she did not want to leave that casket mm -hmm. at first, but she finally mm -hmm. did. So did you go Pierre back? Salinger. Oh, Pierre Salinger, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, he was one of the key ones of the administration. Oh, the, he was yeah. administrative aide, yes, he yeah, was. Yeah. Yeah. So did you go back to D.C. at that time, or did you stay in Texas? No, as a matter of fact, uh, as we were waiting on Sarah Hughes to get there, and Sarah went on upstairs, then one of the guys one of the other agents uh, waved me over to the telephone and said, "Get on the phone." Said they uh, they want you. To, they've got something for you to do. Well, you can imagine I'm a zombie by now. But anyway, uh, they had a, a young man in custody in Fort Worth, and they had stopped him on the turnpike at the Fort Worth side, and he had a, a rifle with a telescopic side on it, and he had a shotgun in the back seat of his car. Well, well make a long story even much longer he uh, had uh, spent the night in the Union Hotel over here that overlooked commerce and, and down across where Dealey Plaza is and uh, so he had uh, had been he, he had picked up a, a young woman of the evening over at the Blue Vera Lounge and he had come to town from Ranger Texas to pick up his dad's deer rifle who was in one of the local gun shops. And he had picked it up and he bought a shotgun while he was there. And he had put them in the car. Well, uh, of course, when, when he, he and this little friend of his that he had picked up for the night watched the motorcade go by. Now the rifle's downstairs in his car. But anyway, when he left there then, he started down uh, the uh, turnpike and he stopped at the Exxon station they were Exxon stations in those days. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, he stopped to get some gas, and the radio and TV was going inside the the, uh, the uh, service station, and this young man was serving. And, and, and in those days, too, you had service station attendants. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, Wasn't yeah. Wasn't that nice? They, they did windows, all kinds of yeah, crazy Yeah, check things. your oil, check your, oh, kick your yeah, tires, yeah. everything. Yeah. Uh, my, grandma, my grandmother used to say, tell him to kick the tires. You know, but anyhow. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, he did. He was doing that, and so... Uh, while he was doing that, it came on the radio that uh, they were talking about that they had a man in uh, custody, but they weren't sure that it was him. And and uh, anyway, uh, uh, this young man that was driving the car was laughing about it, and the one that was serving the car it didn't it didn't set too well with him because the president had been shot, and here's this fellow laughing about it. So he looks in the car while he's putting gas, and he sees this rifle with a scope. And uh, so he said, you, you, you think it's uh, okay for they, that they've shot the president? I asked it, and he made the, the remark that he was a Catholic. He said, ah, he said, that's one way to get rid of, of, of a good Catholic. And so anyhow, he mm -hmm. just made, he made a big joke about it. Yeah. Big joke when he got to the other end, and here's a series of, of, of policemen all over him. Mm -hmm. And so now they send young Mike over to mm -hmm. Fort Worth to interview this fellow to see if he might be a suspect. Well, anyhow, they had already interviewed him. The police department, the uh, homicide, had uh, interviewed him. And a good friend of mine who was an FBI agent, Carter, Agent Carter, he was, he was yeah, I refer to him as an old timer. I think he was about 45, 50. <laughs> but anyway, he had already interviewed him. And he came out, and when I walked up, he said, Mike, this kid don't know anything. He won't tell us anything. but..." 
but he's just a, a dumb kid. I said, well, I better talk to him. He said, yeah, go on and talk to him. So I went in to talk to him, and I did a, I did uh, something that uh, that uh, they should have arrested me right on the spot for. But uh, I, I asked him uh, what his name was, and he said, I don't have to tell you that. I said, no, sir, you don't. So I took my ID out, and I said, I'm, my name is Agent Howard. I'm with the U.S. Secret Service, and I've got to ask you a couple of questions. So I put my book back up, and I said, now, could you tell me where you were last night? And he said, no, I don't have to tell you anything. Now, here's a kid. Uh, I, I, was, I was 31 years old at the time. And I said, I hadn't had any sleep. I was hungry. I wanted to see my wife and family. I didn't like it because my uh, president was on, on the way to uh, Washington in a casket. And I didn't have time for this man. And so I just reached inside my coat, and I was carrying a 38 revolver, and I stuck it right up against his face, just as close as I could get him to, to his nose. I should have, I mean, that, that's a federal offense, you know. You can't do that. That's violating their civil rights. But I didn't know that at the time, and I didn't really care. Mm. So anyhow, I said, now, I'm going to ask you again, and you're going to answer these questions, because if you don't, you know, I could blow your head off, and nobody would care. So nobody's going to care. Our president has been killed, and you're making fun of it, and you don't want to answer any questions. Now, you let me know when you get through talking, because, you know, if you haven't said what I want you to, you could, mm. you could lose it. And, boy, you talk about sweat. Now, he broke into a sweat, and he began to, uh, I've heard this, uh, you sang like a canary. But anyhow, I asked him where he was. He told me. I said, who would you have with you? I picked up this girl over at the Blue Mirror. And I said, where'd you get the guns? That's my father's gun. He said, I went to uh, uh, pick it up there at, at uh, this, this uh, gun shop, and I was taking it back home. Where's home? Ranger, Texas. Are you married? Yes, I'm married. I said, well, what are you doing here now? I see, he said, well, the policeman stopped me out here and said that I said something over there on the, on the, uh, on the turnpike. So I asked him several other questions. And so finally, I took my gun down and put it down. I said, thank you very much. You know, you could have gotten this over with a long time ago. And I walked outside, and <laughs> Agent Carter, his name was Dan Carter, and he was, uh, but anyhow, he said, Mike, would you really have shot him? I said, come on, I wouldn't have, you know I wouldn't have done a thing like mm -hmm. that. And uh, this police sergeant that I'd worked several uh, cases with there uh, on counterfeiting and, and, uh, and forgery, he said, yes, you would. And I said, no, really, I wouldn't. I don't think I would have shot him. And anyway, <laughs> so anyway, I got by with it. Wow. So you were still in the area then. Oh, yeah. When when Oswald was uh, apprehended eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, where were you when all of that was taking place? That was going on while I was in Fort Worth oh, interviewing this, this, this guy. This guy. Yeah, wasting your time with this guy. Wasting my time with yeah, this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The interesting thing about this, that this is the humorous part of it. The, uh, this uh, police sergeant, because this kid had refused to answer their questions and given them a hard time, he put him in jail and held him overnight. Mm. That wasn't the worst part of this guy's problems. Mm. He called his family out in Ranger and told his wife that we have your husband here in jail. He spent the night with a prostitute over in Dallas, but he'll be home tomorrow. Oh, boy, yeah. Now, what? <laughs> can you imagine? Mm -hmm. uh, this the sergeant told me this later. I said, "You didn't really do that." He said, "Yes, I did." Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would have loved to have been there when this young man walked yeah, in no, the house. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, yeah. anyway, that was just a sideline story there. So when? So when did you learn about Oswald and what happened then in Dallas? Before I, before I left Fort Worth, I had in my car. I had a uh, sheriff's frequency radio. Secret Service didn't have radios. But anyhow, so I started back towards Dallas because that's where I was supposed to be with my other guys, you know. And they said, uh, told me, uh, uh, said, stand by, we got a message here for you, and said that uh, to go to the Dallas Police Department and see Agent Sorrells. So Agent Sorrells was the forest Sorrells, uh, head of the Secret Service in Dallas. So I went over to there and I found Mr. Sorrells, and they were interviewing this guy inside the, the interrogation room, and uh, I later found out that that was Lee Harvey Oswald, and so I saw Mr. Sorrells sitting in there. 
So I went in and sat down next to him, and this guy wouldn't tell him anything. He was sitting there, and he was very belligerent, and he had it on his handcuff, and he'd hold him up like this, you know. And, and uh, But anyway, when he left, when they took him out of there to take him to a cell then, then uh, he they paraded him. The, the Dallas Police Department did they had no idea what they were doing at the time. And they didn't know what to do because the, our, our president's been killed and we've got a suspect. And they paraded him by the news media over and over. I mean, not just that time, but over and over. And then they, they were hollering questions at him. And Oswald would yell back something like, I don't know anything, I'm just a patsy. And then they took him up uh, to the cell. Then later on that evening, this was late uh, in, on Friday night. Uh, they brought uh, uh, Marina in and uh, and, uh, and Margarita and the two babies, two years old and five weeks old. And and so I was still there. I, I had gotten a, a something out of the the candy machine and and was still there. But but and uh, Mr. Saul said, "Stay here as long as you can, and I'll send somebody else over." So anyhow, she came in and they and uh, she. They interviewed her, and then she wanted to know if she could talk to her husband. And of course, she didn't speak but just very little English. So she was they had to get somebody to, to interpret for her. And I don't know who they got, but they got somebody. But anyhow, they were gonna let her go upstairs and, and speak with him. So I went upstairs with her, and I stood back away from the window where he couldn't see me to see what was gonna be said. But she spoke in Russian, and she, he kept yelling at her, don't speak Russian here. You've got to speak English. You're in America. And he was very belligerent about it. But anyhow, they, they talked for a few minutes, but I, didn't get, I couldn't hear everything. And then she left, and, and so I followed her back downstairs. Then I get the message uh, the next morning that we're supposed to pick up uh, uh, Marina, the two babies, the, the mother, Margarita, and put them into protective custody. Well, and Mr. Sorrells again was the uh, was the man that told me. That, but he said, "Call, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, Inspector Kelly in Washington. He'll tell you what to do." And so I did. And uh, he said that uh, the president did not want these people hurt. It wasn't their fault what their uh, her husband did. Said, I don't want them hurt. Put them in protective custody. It's President Johnson. Was it's President Johnson giving the order to uh, in Inspector Kelly. Yeah. And so, uh, once again, I, I I was beginning to think that I was Superman because I was doing all these things and and I and I still hadn't gotten any sleep. Yeah. So anyhow, I met a friend coming in the the uh, police department. Meanwhile, she had gone. They the the Oswald had gone. So I met this friend coming into the police department who had just arrived from Washington. He had been to a Secret Service school in uh, in Washington, and his name was Charles Conkle, and he was an agent. And so, uh, Charles, I said, "Hey, Charlie, you're going with me." He said, "Where are we going?" And I told him. He said, well, "What in the world are we doing that for?" I said, because we got orders to do it. So we went out and we found these people, and the, the news media had them in uh, a, uh, a room at the executive inn, which is right outside the entrance of uh, Love Field. And they had them hit out there, or they thought they did. And so we uh, sat on that place overnight, on Saturday night, and made sure we saw the two uh, reporters, one would go, and then another would go, and, and I, I, we could only suppose that they were going to a coffee shop because they'd come back with bags of stuff like food, so anyhow, so we let them bed down for the night, and so so did Charlie and I. So we both got a little bit of sleep because we'd take turns, you know. But uh, when daylight came, one of these guys came out, and then a minute, the other one did, and they both went over towards the coffee shop. While they were gone, we went over and picked up the two ladies, Marguerite, Marina, uh, uh, June Lee, and Rachel. That's the babies. Mm -hmm. And we took them in our car, and we left. And we'd already made arrangements for a place to keep them, and and we uh, started out there to deliver them, and and uh, we stopped by the way to get them something to eat, and then as we uh, started out again, then once again over the sheriff's radio they said, hey, 
uh, Oswald's been shot. And that's when Ruby had shot him down in the basement. And so now then, Marina heard this, and so did Marguerite, and they wanted to go to the hospital. So I turned to Charlie and I said, what do you think? And he said, well, we better just take them. And we did, we took them to the hospital, went the same doors that we went through when uh, we uh, had uh, President Kennedy there. And it was kind of, that was really kind of shaky. Here you go. But, yeah. but we did, we, we let them, uh, we let her go in and, and see the body. And, and she asked me, she, uh, in, in broken uh, Russian and English, why that Oswald had a bruise right here on his side. Well, as it turned out, that was where this policeman had hit him with a pistol. And, mm. uh, he'd taken the pistol away from him and hit him upside the head with it. So, and she just said, oh, never shed a tear. Mm. She didn't show any emotion of any kind. Mm. And so we had them there then for the next uh, four, Four and a half days, anyhow, that we had on protection. So, you, so I, am I correct? You took them to a, what a motel and uh, the end of the Six Flags. End of the Six Flags. Right six there flags, next yeah. to the Six Flag over yeah, there. Right off the turnpike, I guess. Right, yeah, right there. Yeah. So then, uh, then you come. What happened? That that duty completed, or they went out of, or did they remain in in custody, they, in protective custody? They were still just us two agents. Yeah. So we bedded down for the night, and, and uh, we had the uh, sheriff's office then to pick up uh, Robert Oswald. He was a he was a assistant manager at the Acme Brick Company over in Denton, Texas, and so we had him picked up too. They said to get him and uh, put him under the same thing. So we brought him in, and so then he said, "Well, I've got to make arrangements for my my brother's funeral. I mean, he's it's got to be taken care of. Nobody, he couldn't get any." Still uh, home to take that body, so I had to step in once again. My father had been a, a, a funeral director, and then was any time you're a, a, once you're a funeral director, you're always one because he had the credentials. But he was working out at uh, uh, General Dynamics. He was working on that bomber V1 bomber or whatever. Oh, at TFX. TFX. I yeah, think yeah, very much. Yeah. But anyhow, Kirkwood was the other name I. That's was, right. The Kirkwood. So yeah. we. These things finally come back. Kirk, Kirk, that's Kirk who it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so. who he was. Uh, but anyhow, so I got my dad to call a friend of his over in, in Fort Worth, and he said, okay, I'll take him. So he took Oswald's body, and he put him in a county uh, casket. And so then we had to find a cemetery that would take him. Well, we tried to assume names and everything else. We finally mm. got a, a place for him out at uh, uh, Rose but some of their Rosewood. Rose, Rose Hill? Rose Hill. Rose Hill. Rose Hill. Rose Hill. Rose Hill. I'm sorry. Yeah. I knew yeah. it was Rose from coming. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. Which is uh, Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's the city of Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you something. I thought it was in Arlington. Yeah, it was very close. Right and I, I, yeah. I made a joke. I yeah. mean, I got uh, Mrs. Oswald, Marguerite. Yeah. She was very explicit. And she said, my son was a Marine, and he should be buried in Arlington Cemetery. Oh, my. Really? I mean, and I said, well, ma'am, we'll do the best we can, not knowing what we're going to do. So they told us uh, they told us where this Rose Hill Cemetery was, and I said, well, that's pretty close to Arlington, isn't it? And, and uh, old Charlie Cuckle said, yeah. I said, I used to ride motorcycle up there. Fine. I said, ma'am, we got, we got him close to Arlington. <laughs> So you would, you usually don't think about jokes like that at, at, at that time, but but Charlie and I did make a little bit of a joke of it because mm -hmm. he was boy Charlie Cuckle was was very close to the uh, Kennedy family. He had been working with them for some time more than I had, and so he did not like the idea that we were protecting and had in protection Oswald, the guy that killed his president, had them, and we were placing our lives on the line so that they could live. And he was not happy about it. And any time he got a chance to dig, uh, Margarita was what he did. Oh, well, she was quite a personality, I understand. Oh, she, she, well, she had had a nervous breakdown a couple of times because of the children she had. And, and they had been in foster homes most of their lives. And, but anyhow, she, uh, uh, she was something else. In fact, I, mean, it's, I don't know. Now, this is not a good thing to say about the security of the Secret Service. But how she did this, I don't know. But she sneaked in to this hotel room, uh, a bayonet, 
Oh and, my goodness. Yeah, she had a bayonet and she had it under her pillow. And uh, about two nights there, uh, Marina, the young woman, came out and, and woke me up. I was laying on the couch in the, in the front room and she woke me up. Mama, mama, knife, knife. And I said, what? So I got up and went in there and she pointed and the, the handle of this knife was sticking out from under Marguerite's pillow. So I reached in there and I very gingerly took it out. And I said, okay, go back to bed. So she did. And uh, so when Marguerite found out that her knife was missing, whoo, did she throw a tizzy fit. Mm -hmm. She just threw a fit. She she threatened to run off and, and uh, 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 Agent Cuckle said, go ahead. <laughs> you want to run off, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, she was just, she was really loony. Well, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate what you both have contributed, or all three of you really, you know, to kind of our appreciation or understanding of, uh, of the events. Um, I don't know, is, is, there, is there anything we've missed that uh, comes to mind about the, you know, the events that uh, you, you might want to add? Can you, can you think of anything? Well, I, I, think the, I think the people that watch the program would be real interested to know that yeah. Mike stayed in the Secret Service oh, after yeah. the assassination for oh, several yes, more years yeah. and was assigned to President Johnson yes, so while was. he was in office and after he left office. So oh, yeah. Mike, Mike had quite a, quite a range of experiences with those two presidents. Yeah. It was, it was, it's interesting that I was in the hospital room there with, uh, when, uh, they, uh, uh, when the uh, priest came in and pronounced the uh, uh, President Kennedy dead. And then I was in the room with President Johnson when he died. I was up. In fact, I gave him uh, resuscitation CPR, trying to bring him back in, but uh, you know, couldn't save him. But uh, I, 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 I told uh, the rest of the guys jokingly. I said, "Look, don't tell any of the other presidents about me because I mean, if I'm in the room with two presidents yeah, who yeah. died, I, they they might not want me well, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyhow, uh, I did. I, I went, of course, I went with uh, Linda Bird Johnson through uh, University of Texas. Mm -hmm. They sent her, sent me down there with her, which was uh, that was quite an event. That was yeah. interesting. But so pretty good there. for a kid from Nakona. I would say. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. From Nakona, <laughs> Texas. Oh yeah. Well, Nakona just down from uh, yeah. uh, what yeah. uh, Spanish Fort. Spanish Fort, yeah. where yeah. Justin yeah. Boot Company came. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And uh, Edith, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Justin yeah. had Edith her Justin. company mm -hmm. up there, and uh, oh, yeah, she she had the prettiest purple Cadillac that you ever saw. <laughs> She'd come out to this little airstrip mm -hmm. and pick us up to take her to the Boot Company mm -hmm. to have her have our boots measured yeah, so yeah. that we could get some new boots yeah, and then yeah. she'd take us back. The way that we would contact her, we couldn't contact her by telephone yeah. because it was up in this airplane. But we'd tell her when we get there, we'll we'll buzz the place. <laughs> we had a pilot named Barney Hewlett, and he's still alive. He and I are good buddies. But anyhow, he and I would fly up there and uh, He'd take that plane down and he would take it right down over the top of that bin. I'm telling you, it, would, it bound to shake everything in there. But uh, I said, well, Miss Ina, did you get our message? Oh, yeah, we got your message. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, let me ask you one other question. And this, you, you have been a witness to history. You've been part of history. Uh, you've also read all of the ways people have interpreted history, I guess. Is there any kind of shorthand kind of thought you would want to leave people with about uh, as you look at all these conspiracy theories and everything that have been out there what uh, I guess what do you make of all of that or what in your own mind do you settle on as being I guess the, the I guess the final I don't know truth or whatever of the Kennedy assassination well it's it's very very easy to uh, to want this to be a conspiracy I mean, the Secret Service agents that were assigned to the Kennedy detail, they would look so much better if this had been a planned conspiracy by the Mafia or by the Russians or anybody else. They would have looked so much better mm -hmm. if this had, had been the case. But it wasn't. We have here a, a young man that a Chester drawer fell on his head when he was five years old, and he had blackout. He had a tumor on the brain. And he had blackouts from time to time, all, all through his school years. 
And so, and, uh, and this is the kid that came up with the fact that I want to get some recognition in this world. He got into the Marine Corps by a fluke. His, his brother, uh, Robert, actually got him into the Marine Corps thinking that it would help him because of this problem that he had. And uh, so, and, and he did, he got, actually got him in because he, he had to sign for him as a, a, a guardian because he was only 17. But he got him in the Marine Corps and of course the, he didn't, uh, he wasn't in the Marine Corps very long before they realized that something was wrong, but, but they just thought he was a smart out kid because he would do things like he'd, jump, he'd get up on a, a bed and jump off the top of it with the uh, four corners of a blanket over his head and pretend that he was a paratrooper. Mm. And then uh, he had, he, he uh, the first time that he got a, uh, a weekend pass, he went into a, a small town there outside of, of where he was taking his boot camp with the Marines and bought a little 22 pistol. And he brought it back on base. Well, that's against the rules and regulations with military. And he got caught with it. And then he just, he just raised all kinds of fuss that they were, they were trying to take his gun away from him. Well, they court-martialed him, a summary court-martial, and they kept him from getting, he, when you, when you uh, graduate from boot camp, you're supposed to get a PFC strike. Well, they took that away from him. Then they ship him over to Japan to, uh, to uh, guard a naval airstrip there. And there he gets into a problem with, uh, with a, a non-commissioned officer there took a swing at him and, and uh, they did it again. They gave him a summer court martial. So he gets on a freighter going to Helsinki, Russia and, and uh, deserts. Well, then he gets over to Russia and, there, and of course this, that's a pretty long story, but, but he, uh, uh, he wanted to stay there and they didn't want him there either. Because about that time we had a U-2 pilot mm -hmm. named Francis Remember Francis Powers? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, he was there, and the Russians didn't want this former uh, Marine that had deserted because they didn't need him. And so they tried to get rid of him, but he uh, wanted to stay, and so he actually cut his wrist and, uh, and got in a bathtub with water so it looked like he was really bleeding bad. And uh, so the uh, KGB, or the investigating officer, and it was a KGB, but they, they didn't want to say that, but anyway, he did not want to uh, let him go back across the, uh, or kick him out of Russia and to go back across the line because they were afraid that uh, the, the world would think that, that they had uh, been interrogating him and, and they had been the one to cut his wrist. And they didn't want that mm. anymore. So anyhow, because they had Francis Powers. Well, anyhow, he met this young woman and he married her because she wanted to go back to, she wanted to go to, to the United States. Well, anyhow, to make a long story short, she, they had a child and he would have these blackouts because of this brain tumor that he had and he would beat her up uh, from time to time. But he finally did uh, bring her back to America. When he got back to America, he thought he'd be a hero. Mm. When there wasn't any brass band, there wasn't anybody there for him and he just really, was upset and he told his brother and his brother said what did you expect a brass band or something uh, uh, you uh, you think that people are going to welcome you back when you deserted from the marine corps so anyhow he gets to his mother's home and he gets a letter and this is not this i'm not making this up this is a it, i mean he had a letter from the naval department saying that this is a dishonorable discharge and it was signed by the secretary of the navy well he wadded that up and he was really upset about that when his brother told him well if you don't like a dishonorable discharge why don't you just write the naval department and see if they uh, can maybe give you a general and they, they can't give you a, a, a honorable but they might give you a general well he did that and came right back after a couple of three weeks and said no we have to concur with the former Secretary of the Navy and, and your dishonorable uh, uh, discharge stands. Well, he wrote in his little book that he was keeping that he would kill this SOB Secretary of the Navy, who was John Connolly, who was now the governor of Texas. Well, 
uh, who was he shooting at now? Yeah. When they when they uh, they talk about uh, him shooting into that car, was he shooting at Connolly or was he shooting at Kennedy? I'm not going to say which one it was, but I can tell you this: there was a good possibility that the rifle would uh, was uh, off from what it should have been because he had pitched it in the back seat of the car that, that he went to work with that morning, and it, you don't do that with a rifle that has a scope on it. Mm -hmm. And it was completely off. So once again, you have to wonder, did he really want to shoot John Kennedy, or was he still trying to kill the man that gave him a dishonorable discharge, John Connolly? Uh, now that's, that's just yeah. the facts. I, I can't tell yeah. you any better than that. Well, you know, I just, this is so important to American history and, and the facts may never be totally agreed upon, but, but one of the things I was just listening to your story and the fact that uh, so few men, I guess all men at that time in the Secret Service had such a huge responsibility, just kind of overwhelming compared to the thousands today mm -hmm. that yeah. have a similar yeah. kind of responsibility and technology that you know, it certainly wasn't available then, but... Uh, yeah, that's right. We didn't have it. Yeah. Well, I just, on, on behalf of just one, or I guess on our behalf, we want to thank both of you for the, mm -hmm. the service that you've given to this country and, and to the important role that you've played in, in our history. And well, I, I, got, I, I got to tell you something. Yeah. I got to tell you something. This young woman here, though, uh, really deserves so much credit for what uh, went on during all this time because she was the only thing that I could back up on. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the things that were happening to me, she also had happened to her. And But, but she was always there. So tell it, how many years now you've been married? 61 and a half, nearly 62 in, 62. in, in September. Yeah. yeah, so, well. She I stuck with me. Well, I, you know, <laughs> you, you are both marvelous people and we're so proud to have this opportunity to talk to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, thank yeah. you. It's been great. Thanks for coming, Mike. You're You're <laughs> thanks welcome. for coming, Martha. Hey, thanks for the, well. thank, yeah. thanks for taking us to the cattlemen. Yes, so thank we, you, Paul. We love the cattlemen's also. <laughs> <laughs> we love the cattlemen's also. <laughs> thank you.